disability right and um, we'd like to welcome you today to um, our webinar which is going to cover um, uh, rights your so information so you can know your rights during COVID and we're gonna have a specific focus on medical um, on rights around medical care um, access to medical care and um, access to uh, transportation and um, utilities. So um, this grant, uh, sorry, this presentation is uh, funded by a grant from the Developmental Disabilities Council of Connecticut. Um, so we're grateful for their funding and so that we can provide this um, presentation to you today. And a couple of just sort of housekeeping things before we begin. Um, first of all, this is being recorded. And so if you do not want uh, anything that you say recorded, just uh, put whatever questions you have in the chat and um, we can answer them. Um, if you do have a question and you don't mind being recorded, please raise your hand on the feature in the Zoom um, to raise your hand. And then what will happen is um, you'll uh, be called on and um, the, the um, people who are doing the um, tech today will spotlight you and you'll be able to ask your question. And um, also as the presenters are giving their presentation, we will, um, you're welcome to put whatever questions you have in the chat, and then um, we'll call those uh, questions to the attention of our speakers today. We also have um, translation um, in American Sign Language, and we also have a Spanish interpreter. So if you would like um, to use the Spanish interpreter, just log on to the option. Um, you just click it to the, um, to the Spanish language option, and then you will be able to receive interpretation that way. And um, if you have any um, problems or any um, hearing or any technical issues for which you need assistance or any other issues, just uh, try to put that in the chat and we'll try to help you out. Um, and, um, before we begin, we'd like to do a land acknowledgement um, to recognize um, and respect um, the native peoples who, um, for whom we're using their land. And um, so we just want to read a, a land acknowledgement that um, acknowledges that. And uh, this land acknowledgement comes from the University of Connecticut's uh, Native American Cultural Programs. And um, the land acknowledgement is that by acknowledging the land um, that on which we gather is the territory of the Mohegan, Mashataquit, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skagatok, and Good Hill, Pagasat, Nimpuk, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold um, our responsibilities according to their example. So with that, um, I will uh, turn this over to our um, speakers today. We have um, three speakers. We have um, Bonnie Roswig from the Center for Children's Advocacy, and um, we have Sheldon Taubman from Disability Rights Connecticut, and Kathy Flaherty from um, Connecticut Legal Rights Project. So with that, I will now turn it over to um, Sheldon, who will talk to you about um, medical benefits. Thanks, Sheldon. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, there's a short PowerPoint I'm going to use, well, maybe short for me, probably long for other people. <clears throat> Can we uh, pull that up? Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about is, you know, Medicaid is a very large subject, so we're going to limit it to a discussion today about um, where we are in terms of the, the protections against people being cut off of Medicaid because of the pandemic. Um, and I did, in terms of terminology, you know, some people say Medicaid, some people say Husky. It basically means the same thing. There are, there are different Huskies. There's Husky A, um, Husky A, C, and D, and MedConnect, but they're all under Medicaid. So I, I tend to use the term Medicaid, and I think that's what I'll do today. Next slide, please. So what we're talking about today is this federal law called the Families First Act. 
and it was passed right, you know, when the shutdown and everything first happened in, in March of two years ago. Um, and one of the things that Congress did that was good is they wanted to keep people on health care because they need it right now. Um, and so they said to the states, well, um, uh, we'll give you some extra money, but on condition that you, you have to keep people on Medicaid during this public health emergency. What's the public health emergency? It's what the federal agency declared because of COVID-19 to be a special circumstance that warrants basically changing the rules a little bit. And what the uh, federal agency that administers Medicaid called CMS promises states is that, you know, we don't know how long this public health emergency is going to last, but we will give you at, le at least 60 days notice. Okay, right now, the, the official termination of the public health emergency is April of you know, next month. But since they have to give 60 days notice, it's a practical matter. It wouldn't happen until you know, late May, but nobody really expects that either. We expect it to be a couple months at least after that. So as it says here, you know, probably July or later. Next slide, please. Um, and I wanted to be clear that there are certain exceptions that not everybody who's been on Medicaid gets to stay on during the public health emergency. There are certain um, circumstances in which somebody could be cut off. And one, uh, the five are listed here, departure from the state, just leave the state. Second, death. Um, you voluntarily get off benefits. You, you send a note and say, hey, I don't need the benefits anymore. I don't want to be on mine anymore. Call them. If you've done that, that's another reason. Um, the other interpretation of, of this federal law is that from the from the federal Medicaid agency is that well if you weren't if you weren't validly on Medicaid in the first place meaning it was a mistake and then we try to cut you off now because of the mistake that's okay and lastly and this is a problem area um, it's where you're going to be cut off of one kind of Medicaid but you're at least going to stay on some other kind of Medicaid and which which provides a lower level of benefit. And that unfortunately has been happening. Next slide, please. Um, but I do want to be clear about that the typical reasons why people might think they're going to be cut off of Medicaid um, are actually not, per not permitted. They are not allowable reasons for people to be cut off. So typically people, you know, their income changes, they go over income for the particular Medicaid program they're on, or they if, if it's a part of the Medicaid program where there's a resource limit and asset limit, they go over that. Both of those can't be cut off for those reasons. Or if you're on Husky A, that's the program for kids and, and parents of kids and pregnant women, um, that's a situation where you can't um, be cut off just because like you no longer have a child in your custody. Um, another reason, and this is very important, is you didn't respond at all to a request for the annual redetermination. This is something that people on Medicaid are very used to having to do the form every year. Um, during the, this public health emergency, you cannot be cut off because you didn't return the form. Next slide, please. Um, so a, a question is, you know, what has DSS been doing during this whole time? It's now been two years, right? Since the public health emergency was declared and then Congress stepped in and said, and you can't cut people off Medicaid except for one of those five reasons. Um, what has DSS been doing? Well, some of you may actually have gotten redetermination forms in the mail. So they are still doing the redeterminations. And if people don't respond, they sometimes get letters saying, you didn't respond. And if you don't respond, you're gonna be cut off. In fact, you aren't cut off or you aren't supposed to be cut off. It doesn't matter that you don't respond. The reason they're doing that is they're trying to get information. They've been trying to get information during this period because if you do submit the right information showing you're still eligible, they can officially put you on for another full year. And it's better for them and actually better for the clients, for, for the folks on Medicaid if they're officially put on for another year. But if they don't respond or even if they respond and the information shows that they're not eligible anymore, DSS is not supposed to cut them off. Next slide, please. Um, so remember before I talked about um, uh, the, the, the five circumstances, five reasons under which, you know, it is, it is okay um, for somebody to be cut off. And I want to talk about a specific example because this is happening to a lot of people. And that is um, 
the very specific situation is somebody's on Husky D, that's the Medicaid program for people, generally adults, and they don't have minor children in, in the house, and they're not elderly, and they haven't been found to be disabled, but they're low income, Husky D. For people on Husky D, and they've been on that for, for perhaps years, what happens is if you become eligible for Medicare, then you lose your eligibility for Husky D. You might be eligible for a different Medicaid, like Husky C, but you lose Husky D. And initially, under the protections under the Families First Act, the federal law prohibiting people from being cut off, um, you were fine because you're no longer eligible for Husky D, but it's Medicaid you stay on. But what later, later happened is that the federal Medicaid agency told the states, no, you should be cutting people off if they qualify for at least some Medicaid program. So it can be a less beneficial Medicaid program. And that's what they're doing in the case of people who qualify for Medicare and then qualify for the Medicare savings program, which covers Medicare premiums and cost sharing. And a lot of you may be familiar with that. QMB is the most common program. And it's a great program, but all it does is fill in the holes of Medicare in terms of the cost sharing. It doesn't provide other things that full Medicaid benefits provide. Well, the state, Connecticut, is now telling people, sorry, you're not eligible for Husky D anymore, but you'll still be on a kind of Medicaid, you'll have a Medicare savings program. And this has caused you know, a lot of concern for people, but unfortunately it is, it is okay for, for DSS to be doing that. Next slide, please. So we don't know when the public health emergency is going to end, right? Big guess, maybe June, July, my guess is later. Um, at some point it comes to an end. And remember I said there'll be six days notice. At that point, the federal Medicaid agency told all the states, you will have a year, 12 months, to go ahead and do redeterminations for everybody. So that includes all those people who were kept on because of the protection, meaning they didn't submit a form, they, they didn't, didn't provide any response at all, or they submitted a form, they were found to be ineligible, or they submitted a form and DSS asked for something else and they didn't respond. All those people, unless it's one of those five circumstances specifically where cutting off is permissible, had to have been kept on. All of these folks are gonna be subject to full redeterminations in the next 12 months after the end of the public health emergency. And with all of those reviews required to be completed um, in 14 months. Now, if you are a person who went through the redetermination process properly, and you were found to be eligible still, then you were kept on for another year. So DSS would not look at you for at least another year from that time. So let's just say that in November of last year, you submitted the redetermination papers, showed you were still eligible, and they found you eligible officially, then they will not mess with you until November of this year. Next slide, please. Um, so what's DSS going to do as, when, they, when they have to do these redeterminations? Um, so, as, as it says here, they must do a full redetermination of the person's eligibility. That means you consider all kinds of Medicaid. It's not just the particular Medicaid program they're on. They were on Husky D, but, but what about C? What about A? They have to consider all of the possibilities for, for eligibility for Medicaid. Um, and and the, one of the reasons that, by the way, that um, the, the federal Medi Medicaid agency is requiring this is that things have changed a lot, right? People's lives change a lot. So it's really important to look at all the circumstances before you consider cutting somebody off, make sure they're not eligible for some other kind of Medicaid. When DSS does this, they're supposed to see if based upon the records they already have, that is to say DSS electronic records, Department of Labor electronic records, whatever, any government records, they're supposed to check to see if the person, if there's enough information that they can find them eligible and put them on based on that or keep them on based on that. If they don't have sufficient information, they're supposed to ask the person in writing, in the mail, you should get a letter saying, hey, we need information from you to see if you might be eligible, either for the program you are on, the part of Medicaid program you are on, or maybe some other part of the Medicaid program. Please respond. Next slide, please. So if the result of all that is that, sorry, we have the information and it shows you're not eligible, or you do respond, you provide all the information you have and it shows you're not eligible, or if you, you just don't respond, 
at that point. Remember, not responding the last two years really hasn't ultimately been a problem, but now not responding is a problem. And so in that case, they can cut you off of Medicaid with at least 10 days advance written notice telling you about the right to appeal and how you appeal um, if you believe it was an error. That must be in writing. And that's supposed to go out in every case before anybody is cut off of Medicaid for any reason. And they should also tell people that um, there's other means of getting health insurance that might be affordable as well for them. They might be eligible for Medicare, or they might be able to get subsidized um, commercial insurance on Connecticut's health insurance exchange, which we call Access Health Connecticut. The, the subsidies are actually quite generous right now, so people probably could afford insurance uh, through that means. They're supposed to tell people about that. And then the other thing I noted here, and this is kind of important because it's such a problem with bad addresses uh, where uh, mail gets returned to DSS because, you know, they had the wrong address. Well, it's going to really be a problem because people have, it's been two years and people, if they, you know, if they didn't get the thing in the mail because it was the wrong address, they were kept on anyway. Well, now it's going to matter, right, if the mail gets there or not. And so the federal Medicaid agency has told the states they've got to do a little extra Getting a return mail is not good enough. You then have to check to see if you've got some other way of finding out what their address is. And if you have a phone or email, you gotta try checking that too and checking other state agencies data, anything to make sure people don't fall through the cracks. Uh, next slide. Oh, that's the end. So <laughs> uh, since we have so little time, I, it was a abbreviated version, but um, that's it for now. Thank you. Questions? So Sheldon, I actually have a question. I know we um, are a little tight on time, but so given what you said about, you know, it sounds like the program was extended because of COVID. Um, so what does someone do if they think the only reason that they're still on was because of COVID and maybe they didn't ever send back the paperwork? I mean, what, should they be doing anything in particular, contacting anybody or, and what's going to happen next to them? The good news to that is they don't have to do anything. Um, they're going to stay on until DSS gets that redetermination. The problem could be the last thing I mentioned, which is the mail. And so if you think they may not have your current address, make sure you notify them of that so that if they do try to cut you off, um, you'll be able to get the notice. But at this, at this time, you don't have to do anything. You will stay on until you're contacted. Well, then I have a question for you. For anybody who was left on those benefits during the last year, two years, do they have to worry about paying the state back if they're later found to have not been eligible? No, um, the federal Medicaid agency weighed in on this and they said that anybody who got benefits, even if they weren't eligible for the last two years, no, they have to pay it back. And even during the coming, whenever that end of the public health emergency occurs and that 12 months later and that you know, it takes them months to get to you. Um, and then they find you were never eligible. You still don't have to pay back. Nothing to worry about there. And uh, I think we have a question from somebody in the audience, um, Ms. Hackett. Hello. Well, then quick question. You had said that if a person is found to be eligible for Medicare, um, then they are no longer eligible for Husky. Um, but what about the fact that there's a two year waiting period, it's 24 months, I believe, or 23 months. Isn't that correct? So is it still the same thing? You have to go to Access Health CT for that so, situation? Just to clarify, what I said is if you are on become eligible for Medicare, you're no longer eligible specifically for Husky D, not the other Huskies, but Husky D. And so you lose that eligibility. But if you're the two year waiting period, you're not on Medicare. So you're found to be disabled, getting social security disability, you wait two years until you actually get on Medicare, you're still eligible for OCD. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, um, well, um, thank you, Sheldon. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I think we have one more question. This is uh, Alvin. Yes, hi, thank you. Yeah, I did have a question in regards to the extension. 
um, expiring. <clears throat> I have an issue that has just come up recently where I have a Spanish speaking um, set of parents who haven't received any information um, and unaware of this. And so I was kind of looking into this and you know, letting them know that you know, there is this extension, they're not gonna be cut off, which obviously they were relieved about. But I feel like there has been a lack of communication on that part especially in regards to the deaf and hard of hearing community where they may or may not be able to read these letters that may have gone out. Can you maybe kind of, you know, I think, you know, that the communication is like an issue and I'm just wondering where we could possibly pinpoint, you know, further information for that. Well, I agree. The information has been really poor and those of us who have seen those notices know that they're completely confusing and, 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 they say, for example, you're being terminated and you're not being terminated. You're being cut off and you're not being cut off. Or they, on the same notice, they say contradictory things. It's a real problem. So all I can say is that we are we are advocating with DSS about the messaging when the time comes. But one, you raise a good question and it makes, it, makes me think that maybe some, the advocates should try to get together and put out their own messaging, right? Telling people about how they've been protected and what and what's coming. Thank you. Okay, well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and so now we're going to um, move shift from medical benefits to talking about transportation. And um, Kathy Flaherty from CLRP is going to um, give that presentation. So take it away, Kathy. Thank you, Deb. Um, I'm going to talk about non-emergency medical transportation, what you sometimes see abbreviated as NEMT. Uh, but a lot of people talk about VEO, V-E-Y-O. VEO is a company. They are a logistics company, which means they're supposed to uh, know how to figure out complicated things and make them work. I had a note to myself to insert laughter here because I think for anyone who has had to deal with that company, um, they would think that they don't always make complicated things work well. Um, and sometimes they make things that should be easy, a lot more complicated. But NEMT is a benefit for people who are on Medicaid and it provides transportation to medical appointments that can, during the pandemic, include pickup and drop off for either getting a COVID vaccine or getting COVID testing. They're not gonna go to a drive-through site and sit there in the car with you while you're waiting, but they will pick you up, uh, they will pick you up at your house, bring you, um, and then pick you up and bring you back home. When you have no other way to get there, it does apply to physical health visits, mental health or behavioral health visits, and dental visits. What it does not cover is transportation to a pharmacy to pick up prescriptions, or if you have to get medical equipment that's not personally fitted to you, that you will have to arrange your transportation on your own. <coughs> You're eligible for the program if you're on Husky A, Husky C, or Husky D. If you cannot drive yourself or you don't have somebody else who can drive you to a medical appointment. VAO is like a booking service. They don't directly provide you the ride. They connect somebody who needs a ride to a person who's going to provide the ride. And so they're kind of the middleman of that. Um, and so what a person has to do is call VAO and you have to do that 48 hours in advance of your appointment, um, unless it's an emergency. And then sometimes you can get the ride in a shorter period of time. Um, but you can book a trip with them up to 30 days in advance. Um, if you have an appointment with your doctor, but it's not urgent, and you have waited to the last minute to call VAO for a ride, 
you may have to reschedule your appointment. I will put their number in the chat when I'm done speaking, uh, but their number is 855-478-7350. Several ways that VAO provides transportation that gets booked. Um, some people think automatically of delivery cars, like the taxi that except now they're really private people driving independent cars to pick you up picking you up and delivering you to your appointment um if if somebody needs a wheelchair accessible van they are supposed to arrange for that but some people if they live close enough to public transportation and their medical provider is on that bus line they will provide people bus passes to their appointment um, and some people who are on may have their own car and can drive themselves, but they submit for what's called mileage reimbursement. Um, and that's a whole other process, <coughs> which people often face challenges with. An issue that's certainly come up during the pandemic is what happens if the person either has COVID or is suspected of having COVID. If that's the case, the person cannot book a trip to the doctor themselves. Their medical provider has to reach out to VAO to schedule that ride because VAO has what they call a specialty fleet um, to uh, transport people to visits if they either have COVID or are suspected of having COVID. And then the interesting thing is, when you have recovered from COVID, your doctor has to contact VAO again so they can clear you out of their system so you can go back to scheduling your rides normally. Drivers are supposed to wear masks. That is something that people can complain about if the driver isn't wearing their mask in the car. Um, drivers don't provide assistance to people. Uh, so you have to get yourself from whatever building that you're in out to their car yourself or have somebody else helping you to do that. If you're at a medical facility, the met folks at the medical facility have to help you to do that. Their drivers don't come inside to get you. Um, I think that's a, an issue that has long been a problem where people just aren't making the connection. So, <coughs> want to outline some of the issues that people have and then I think Sheldon and Bonnie are going to ask me some questions but they all kind of has a distance where they want you to see your medical provider within that certain circle from your house um, if you need to see a specialist or a doctor who's outside of that mileage range you have to have your doctor fill out a form called a medical necessity form. If VAO thinks that you can take the bus, but you can't take the bus because maybe you have profound anxiety, um, you can't be in crowds of people, your medical provider again is going to have to fill out that medical necessity form. Some people have recurring visits um, and you can schedule, if you, if you have a regular appointment with the provider, you know you're going to go repeatedly. You remember how I told you, you can schedule 30 days in advance. Recurring, you can schedule up to 180 days in advance. Um, if you need accommodations, you are entitled to accommodations under the Americans with Disability Act. VAO is a private company but they are doing the work of the state of Connecticut. So they have obligations um, to you. And that can mean if you have a service animal, an animal that's trained to do a task for you, you can bring your service animal in the car. That's a service dog. It is not an emotional support animal. Emotional support animals are not covered by the ADA. Um, there are issues sometimes where people uh, who need wheelchair accessible vans, they will say, oh, we can't find you a provider. 
that's not an acceptable answer. Um, there are lots of times where uh, over the past couple of years when VAO has done presentations um, to various oversight committees, it becomes clear that they don't understand that the ADA is a civil rights law. Um, and they seem to think it may relate to their ability to provide customer service. Um, and that's something that I know we all as advocates have been trying to make clear to VAO and to the Department of Social Services that they have obligations to people with disabilities when they run this program. Um, that's kind of an overview. Um, I wanna open it up to questions. I think we have some pre-selected questions um, from either Sheldon or Bonnie and then open it up and I saw some things in the chat that I'll wait for Deb to ask. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. So, I, I mean, I think you raised some really important points. Um, and I think that for anybody in the audience, I mean, the there wasn't a problem for the last two years because so, or for, for a lot of people, because everyone shifted to telehealth. Um, but now that the Intel help doesn't work for everyone. Now that people are shifting back to in-person appointments, we are hearing of all kinds of issues, particular, particularly for people with disabilities. So please feel free to reach out to us around those issues because VAO gets an enormous amount of money from the state of Connecticut. Um, it is required by the federal government that this transportation be provided. So we would like to hear about problems that you're having, um, particularly related to their not helping you or providing, as Kathy said, um, the services that you need be based on your disability. Um, but I guess one of my questions, Kathy, that, that you didn't address yet is, what about um, someone who needs an assistant with them to come to an appointment, either you know, because of a physiological problem or because of an anxiety um, issue and they need someone to come with them um, to a doctor's appointment. Um, this person isn't the patient, but the patient themselves really wants them to come. Um, is this someone that uh, VAO has to provide a ride to as well? That is a great question, Bonnie. And if the person needs that companion or assistant, as the result of a physical or mental health condition, that, that would be an accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So VAO would have to provide transportation. Um, I, you didn't ask this, but I, it's not like VAO is going to go to the other person's place to pick them up. So have your companion with you at your own house where you're getting transported from to go to the appointment. Um, but they can also require the person to fill out that medical necessity form um, that for a request for the accommodation, but they absolutely should provide that transportation. Thank you. And my, and my other question is you mentioned it briefly, but so, you know, what happens when you need um, transportation that can accommodate a wheelchair? Um, is Vail allowed to say no because they don't have a car? I mean, what, what happens in that situation? Well, when you need a wheelchair accessible vehicle because you have a disability that requires you to use a wheelchair, again, that's an accommodation. Um, I think the biggest challenge we've seen in Connecticut over the course of years is Vail was very much built as a company on a model of using independent drivers like Uber and Lyft kind of model. Um, as opposed to working with transportation companies, which the previous transportation broker, uh, which some of you remember, because I saw their name pop up in the chat, Logisticare, had a relationship with these various companies. Um, and so the fact that they've chosen to use a model where they're using random people with their random cars, it's on Veo and behooves Veo to figure out who they need to build relationships with because there are people who use wheelchairs who will need transportation to medical appointments and VAOS gets paid the money to set up those that transportation. So it is on them 
Um, it, but I think, Bonnie, you may have more than I encountered uh, situations where facilities actually made arrangements for people because VAO was such a total failure. Yes, Kathy, I think we should, you know, take some of the questions from the chat, but you're absolutely right. The, you know, we are, we are seeing incredible wait times. We are seeing rides not show up. Um, you know, and it, again, um, per, let us know, um, because you, people should not be waiting two hours for a ride. People, rides should just not show up to really important, um, appointments. And particularly before COVID, we had a lot of situations where, um, doctors were dismissing, were telling patients they couldn't come anymore because they weren't making it to appointments. This is not, this is a horrible practice um and this is again this is your medicaid benefit you should be getting it um this company gets a lot of money um to provide this service and it is a responsibility of the department of social services to make sure that you're getting the ride that you deserve so let's continue the conversation so uh, thank you, Kathy and Bonnie. So there's a couple of questions in the chat and um, there's also one for Sheldon, uh, which we could get back to, but um, there's one question which um, asks uh, is, and I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but it's asking whether my mileage, um, the mileage issue is a DDS issue. Um, and then there's a comment that it's worse than something called Logistic care. Logistic, logistic care? care is the previous company that had the contract to arrange the rides. And um, I actually might have to bounce this question to either Bonnie or Sheldon. It may be that the mileage is set in the contract between Department of Social Services and VAO, but I actually don't know the answer. I don't know if either one of you do. Uh it is it is required in the contract that DSS contracted with Vail, the current company, to say you will be responsible for running that that part of the system. And um, there's another comment um, by the same gentleman um, saying that the wheelchair vans are uh, minivans and are limited in terms of wheelchair size. And, um, so, are you uh, know about that issue? No, I mean, it, it's it's very important point for us to know um, because they are required to provide, to accommodate to whatever you need. Um, and I know it's very easy for me to sit here and say, yeah, they're supposed to do it. Um, but that's sort of the job of the different agencies who are here today is to, you know, hear about the problems that you're having, hear about why these companies aren't doing it, and then you know, we're going to do our best to restart this process of addressing it again as we were doing before COVID. And I think I would just add is one thing that we've seen uh, it, and the reason that Sheldon, at, when he was at his previous job in Bonnie, kind of brought me into this advocacy is we really saw going back to logistic care, the failure to accommodate people with mental health conditions. Um, and when people needed different levels of transport and or needed to go to providers that were further away, it was almost as if they just, oh, everybody has a little bit of anxiety, so it doesn't matter and we're not going to help you. And that's not the way it's supposed to work. Um, so I think at this point, I, I seeing the time, I think we've hit questions. I know I can address other things in the chat. Um, for me, and I know you said that there was that one question for Sheldon. So, well, we can um, come back at the end if we have some time. And um, if we don't, um, you know, you're welcome to email the questions to DRCT and we will get them answered. Um, uh, so don't worry about that. Um, so our um, next speaker is Bonnie Roswig from um, the Center for Children's Advocacy, and she's going to talk about your rights with respect to utilities. Um, so I will turn this over to Bonnie. 
Oh, I think you're muted, Bonnie. It'd be helpful if I unmuted myself. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending today. My name is Bonnie Roswig. I'm an attorney with the Center for Children's Advocacy. Um, so, you know, what, you know, it's nice to have light, but, you know, why else is it important to us? Um, we all need it, you know, for our comfort level, but it, but it's, it, it affects so many other aspects of our lives. Um, I think, are we going to have the uh, PowerPoint, please? Great, thank you. Um, so you can go to the first slide, the next slide, please. Um, you know, we need it for our health. We need it for our safety. Um, anyone who's renting, um, it you those lease requirements usually include having utilities, particularly if you're in any kind of subsidized housing. Um, obviously, to get to work, if you have children that need to do homework, they need lights, they need heat. Um, and in particular, um, people with health care conditions, they are in particular need of stable lights and stable heat. Next slide, please. So, you know, happily in Connecticut, um, there are certain what we call utility protections. And that's not because utility companies have woken up one day and decided to be nice to you. It is the law in the state of Connecticut. So prior to COVID, and COVID complicates everything a little bit, um, what, there is a law in Connecticut that is what we call winter or hardship protection. It's between November 1st and May 1st. And really anyone who has limited income is eligible to be classified as someone who gets this winter or hardship protection. So really anyone who gets any kind of benefits. So SNAP or SSI or cash assistance or Husky. Um, not only that, but it's really anyone who earns up to 60% of the median income in the state. In Connecticut, that's pretty high. So that's 75,000, up to $75,000 for a family of four. So what does that mean? Um, what that means, what does hardship and winter protection means? It means that as of that November 1st date, um, the utility companies cannot shut your service off as long as you are coded for this hardship protection. And really all that take this, how to start that is to call the companies. They, your lights and heat have to be on even if you've been shut off in the past. So if you, if it is October and your service is off, you can call them and they have to turn you back on as of November 1st. If you have a large back bill that you haven't been able to pay, it doesn't matter. Now, the important thing to remember is that the, the bill doesn't go away, the back bill, and every month you continue to build on what you owe. Um, every month you get a new light bill, every month you get a new heat bill. Um, and this all ends as of May the 1st. Next slide, please. The other um, thing about getting this hardship protection is that it entitles you to um, special affordable payment plans. And again, these plans are part of the law. This isn't something that Eversource or UI made up. They are required to provide you with these programs. So there's a couple um, The for, for heat. There is, are these programs called matching payment programs or to make it more complicated, below budget worksheets. Under those programs, if you're someone who gets state or federal benefits, so you know, again, SNAP, Husky, et cetera, your monthly bill can be $50 a month. Again, no matter what you owe, no matter what your usual monthly bill is, it can be as low as $50 and you can request this and they have to give it to you. Um, the other thing about this, these are what they call matching payment programs. And I work with a lot of people who call the companies and don't have a clue of what, about what they're saying because it all sounds so complicated. But it real, what it really means is every time you pay, make your payment and you have a back bill, 
they subtract however much you've paid from your back bill. The only other requirement of this program is that you have to apply for what we call energy assistance. Energy assistance is money from the federal government to the Department of Social Services to the community action agencies for your back heat bill. And it can be a significant amount of money. I believe in for this season, it's between 700 and a thousand dollars. Again, that doesn't go to you, but it goes to pay your back heat bill. Um, and again, you have to call the community action agencies in the Hartford area. Every town has their own community action agency in Hartford, it's CRT in the New Britain area, it's HRA. Um, and all you need to do is call the utility company or United Way's 211 info line, um, and you will get that information about how to contact them. And the only other requirements is in order to continue on this program after May 1st is to make your payment, your $50 payment every month. But critical here is that you sign up for this program before May 1st, again, before the end of this winter protection program. Next slide, please. Um, there's also special payment programs for electric customers. Um, uh, Eversource has something called Newstart and UI has something very similar. What you pay is your average monthly bill. So you might be behind by $1,000, but your new bill every month is 75. All you have to pay is that $75. Doesn't matter how much of a back bill you have. Um, the other even better thing about this program is that even though your monthly bill may be a little higher, um, they will match, so subtract from what you owe one twelfth of your back bill. So if you owe $1,000 every month, they're going to divide that by 12 and deduct one twelfth. And at the end of the year, you will owe nothing except your new bill going forward. The other nice thing about this program is you can sign up at any point of the year. It doesn't have to be during that November 1st to May 1st time period. Next slide, please. Um, the other, so the third program which people have heard about, um, perhaps in when they've called the utility companies is something called the COVID-19 payment program. So, you know, Sheldon talked about the health emergency and in March of 2020, when, when COVID ramped up, um, the governor declared a public health emergency and it was determined that no one's light or heat or water could be turned off. Um, it is, and during that, during that period, people could still sign up for these special programs that I mentioned, but they also developed a third program called the COVID-19 payment program. And these were for people whose income was above that $75,000 a year for a family of four. So it's for any heat or light co customer. And what's supposed to happen, the way the, at the plan is written, um, is it's supposed to be over 24 months. So every month you pay your new bill, plus your back bill is broken up into 24 parts. So all you do is pay your new bill every month and a little bit of your old bill. Um, the problem with this is that of the programs that I described before, it's the most expensive. And the bottom line for everybody is in order to be successful with your bills, they have to be affordable. Um, and so this plan was the least affordable, but in my experience, the utility companies advertised it the most. But this doesn't, but you, people shouldn't be signing up for this if they're eligible for the other programs, because the other programs are less expensive and have more of a benefit. Next slide, please. All right, so there's, um, there are a couple other protections in Connecticut rather than those, than the, what we call that hardship or winter protection, and it's called medical protection. Um, and again, it's a law. Um, the medical protection law says that if 
based on your medical or mental health condition, you require heat or electricity, then your service cannot be turned off. Now, this uh, con medical condition has to be either serious or life-threatening, and those are the terms in the law itself. Um, and the way you get this is that your medical provider, the doctor, the APRN, um, the psychologist, the therapist has to fill out a form. And you call the utility company, you tell them that you think you're eligible for medical protection, and they send the form to your medical provider. Um, it also includes not only that you're eligible, but the length of time that your doctor or nurse thinks that you will need this um, protection. Your, again, your lights and your heat can't be turned off. Doesn't matter how much you owe. Um, and But the other thing is, because you are eligible for this medical protection, you can be enrolled in one of those affordable payment programs. Um, and it's a great opportunity to do at that point because they are affordable and because this, you might not need this medical protection um, forever. Um, and it will stop once you get, once you are better and the monthly bill continues to come up. Um, next slide, please. Um, there's also something just quickly called infant protection. Um, it's for children under 24 months of age. Again, um, it's for people whose income is under that 60% of median income. And it's for children under two who are being discharged from the hospital and they need lights or they need health uh, gas for their health and well being. Um, next slide. So again, you know, I can't stress enough, get the help now, call, get on the programs before May. Um, it's, it is really important. It is affordable for now um, to get the help, um, you know, the call the community action agencies for that energy assistance, for that money towards your back heat bill. Um, Operation Fuel is another wonderful resource that again has money for your back light bill. Um, in my experience, the utility companies are not always helpful and do not necessarily provide you the information that you need. So you can call me. Um, I get on the phone and I call the utility companies with clients so that they can get the programs that they need. And I absolutely am happy to do that. You know, the other thing is you can call the state. The Public Utility Regulatory Authority oversees these companies. Um, and you need to tell them when, when the utility companies are not treating you right, if they're not giving you an affordable arrangement, or, or they not, were not respectful. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Connie, this is a question from Kathy. Uh, you mentioned the medical protection, and it requires my doctor to fill out a form. What if I am disabled? I asked my doctor to fill out the form and my doctor refuses to do it. What can I do at that point? Well, I think that, you know, it, again, the relation, getting the protection, um, it's not just because you have a diagnosis. It's, it's if, and again, it's complicated language. If you have a life-threatening condition such that the absence of heat or light will, will put your life at risk. So, it's, you know, perhaps making sure that your provider understands what you're asking for, you know, but the other thing is that there are, I have lots of clients who call and say, my doctor says I'm not eligible for medical protection. It's February. What do I do? Lots of people haven't heard of this hardship protection. So, you know, look to other protections that you could utilize. You know, Kath, I, you, you brought up something really important that I didn't mention, but I am concerned that some of these programs do, um, um, that people with disabilities cannot access them. For example, if you are someone who can't use a computer and you are someone who can't go to a payment center um, to pay a bill, for UI, you can call and have a call center rep take your payment, but it costs more money. And, you know, it's $3.95. It's, you know, 
it's not an enormous amount if you have the money to pay it, but people with disabilities should not be penalized. So if, if anyone is having this situation, I would love to talk about it because again, you know, we talk a lot about the Americans with Disabilities Act. People with disabilities shouldn't be treated worse or simply because they have a health care condition. Uh, Bonnie, um, this is Sheldon. Um, I've heard that um, people have problems with paperwork um, with Eversource uh, that shows they're eligible for the Winter Protection Program or the other affordable payment programs. And why is the why is the process so complicated? And is there anything that people can do with that? It's a really good question, and, and it's really true. It is very complicated at the moment. In order to get um, the hardship status. Eversource is requiring that you upload documents to their website. And again, this is very difficult for, for anyway. It's certainly difficult for people that don't have desktops or laptops. Um, and or they make you go to one of these community action agencies, which again can be difficult. You have to wait to get an appointment. Um, happily, we have advocated at the State Utility Commission that there, why can't there be other ways to do this? Why can't you email this? Why can't you send it in the mail? So the yesterday, Wednesday, the Utility Commission came out um, with a hopefully, which will be final order, opening up those ways that you can submit that documentation. What can I do if I am do have that unaffordable bill? or the utility company is giving me a hard time. Do I just call you? Absolutely, you can, you can call me. You can call um, the state. The, there is part of the law, you know, it's very interesting. This is all, I'm not, I'm not making this up. I'm not making, you know, I'm not saying this because I am so concerned that the utility companies are making so much money and they're charging everyone so much money. But the law says that payment plans should be reasonable and affordable given your situation. And you know, more and more people should be be asking for that. It's not it, they the utility companies don't call all shouldn't be calling all the shots, and it shouldn't be there has to be flexibility. That's what the law requires. So yes, absolutely, people can call me. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, we just really only have one more minute left. So um, I'll just um, see if there's one, any, maybe one question. Okay. Um, well, thank you everybody for participating today. We very much enjoyed having you here and um, we are happy to email you the slides if you would like. Um, we probably can't do that until next week, but um, we're happy to do that. And everybody enjoy your weekend. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.